So for a little exercise analysis today, <clears throat> I was going to try to take a look at um, a row. And in <laughs> we're attempting to, to make the skeleton be our <clears throat> example of what you might think of as a cable row. Now obviously I'd have to put him way back here to get his arms straightened out. But there's some important things here to consider in any row, and especially a cable or a dumbbell row, where the um, line of resistance and the magnitude of the resistance, the amount, is, is really unchanging outside of something like inertia. <clears throat> so here's what happens. This person is back here. This resistance is in line with his arm. It is running through his uh, wrist, through his elbow, through his shoulder. And that is a really strong place to be, not so much physiologically strong, but structurally strong. Because he can hold a lot of weight here, mostly and as much weight as he can hold with his grip and whatever doesn't make his shoulder dislocate. So yeah, you can hold with zero moment arms, you can hold a lot of load. Now the interesting thing is, as he starts to row, is he still in the frame? Yeah. And comes back here like this, I'm gonna move him up here. Things change. So right now, if we were to look at the line of resistance, the profile, the resistance profile, it's actually the resistance has increased. Not because it's not still the same five pounds, that's about all he can do, but because this line of force is now between his elbow and his shoulder with a moment arm respectively to each joint. Typically, if you're using a challenging load, that's gonna be about a third above the elbow and two thirds below the shoulder. Um, and that's, that's a real super generalization, but let's just say that's it for now. <clears throat> but we went from a zero moment arm balanced through his, your joints to significant moment arms. The resistance went up. The resistance went up. If you want to go to the physics of it, it's about torque. So torque equals moment arm times force. There's that crazy part. You can forget that and just say, wow, it's no longer balanced, so I'm having to work harder. Here's the crummy part. In pulling exercises, the muscles of the shoulder are for the most part <clears throat> mechanically and uh, physiologically getting weaker as you go back there. So this is gonna be tough to show, but bear with me, okay? <laughs> I've got this, this <laughs> version of a lat that's been draped on him back here with duct tape of all things instead of tendon, of course. And it goes around here and kind of stops off at the shoulder blade for a little attachment. Actually goes towards the front of the arm on the inside over here. So can you kind of sort of envision that there's a lot? It actually looks pretty good on the video there. <laughs> but that's, that's our visual representation of fiber direction. And I am in no way dismissing all the other players in this that attach to the scapula and are more single jointish in terms of their function. They're all uh, collectively shoulder extensors, including portions of the deltoid up here on the posterior side. Lots of stuff I'm leaving out too, but let's look at this guy just as a representative of the whole thing. And probably the most changeable, because it's a two joint muscle, going through the greatest excursion of lengthening and shortening. Because it is, uh, its length is influenced by the position of two joints, not just one. So as I reach pretty far forward, with protraction included, this sliding forward, that's gonna be a significant lengthening, even of some fibers more than others. As I start to do the row, not only is there a shoulder extension component, meaning your arm going back this way, there will also, if it's done correctly, be a retraction component. So really what happens, and I can't show you well on this guy because his scapula is stuck on there, but there would be a significant shortening because as I'm retracting, not only is the arm changing angles and moving back here, uh, in concert with the shortening of the muscle, the whole scapula, its whole foundation, is moving further back, if that makes any sense. So let me, let me try to show you from another angle, and it's just, it's just not easy on, on video, and this is gonna be quite a juggle, but sometimes it's cool to look from other perspectives. And if you look from above, and you see an arm that's kind of forward like this, and you've got to imagine that muscle wrapping around here and attaching to the front of this guy. And so it's really, that muscle's lengthened now as it attaches in here. Can you envision that? And as I start to come back, and the scapula goes back, now in real life it doesn't dislocate, the scapula go back also. This, this point of attachment can get easily back even with the back of the body as I retract and extend my shoulder. 
So what that really does is a couple things. A, that muscle can get really, really short, which means it's going to lose active tension generating capabilities in the length tension curve. It's getting less tension production capabilities. As are a lot of the other muscles, but this most dramatic, because again, as I said, it's two joint muscle. Also, it's losing its anatomical pulley. Now this skeleton's been through it and his ribs are broken and he's been around for 20 years. Um, but he's a good one to show that from this point of view, this rounded rib cage acts like a pulley. And if you've got, if you've got lats that are tying in here, but wrapping around the rib cage, by the time they get here, guys, let me see if I can get the angle right. Uh, maybe like that. They are pulling backwards. There you go. So as they wrap around the body here, they're pulling this way on a forward placed arm. And they're pulling this way, but by the time the arm gets back to here, they're really pulling more straight across. No longer helping with the shoulder extension component much. Kind of like bailing out and leaving it all on the posterior deltoid, honestly, at that point in time. So that's not a good thing or a bad thing necessarily. It's just a reality. And the point is that the further back you want to go, there's going to be a point right here where you start to lose the lat and going back any further is going to take a dramatic reduction in resistance. Or you're going to have to cheat like crazy with your hips and your low back, which is what most people do. That whole launching it thing. Just how they get back to a super weak place with an inappropriately increasing load. Inappropriately increasing? Yeah, because your body's getting weaker if you're going back there with control. The load's increasing due to moment armors you're going back there. This is one of those examples of an exercise that although traditional, although we believed in it forever, and it still produces effect, it's, um, it's not as effective or efficient as, as it could be because the strength profile and the resistance profile are going two different directions. And that either demands, well, a couple, three things. Either we need a device that decreases the resistance offered um, via a machine or something. You're going to have to spot them and help them so they don't want to cheat and use other things because using this and this, the low back and stuff, that's not what the exercise is for. Um, you need to do two different exercises with two different loads, one up here where you're really strong with a certain load, and one back here with a lighter load, so you can have a full range challenge or close to it. Um, or you're gonna have to cheat. And that's the problem with reversed strength profiles and resistance profiles is they demand cheating. Because if I've got a weight that I can move up here, and it's a challenging thing up here, the only way to get it back here is to do all this other stuff. And it becomes that skill of making it easier, that skill of launch timing. And you see it all the time. And what I just did right there, you've seen people row and popping it into place like that. And that's an attempt at avoiding muscular challenge in order to deal with an inappropriate resistance profile. So anyway, there's just some things to think about. And uh, probably if we had a real person, A, they would be able to see the skeleton. But uh, maybe we'll try that again with a real person sometime. And it can be a part two kind of thing of this, where they can actually do what I'm saying. But this hopefully just gave you a little bit of an inside view that you can keep in mind when we go back and look at it in real life sometime.